A star tracker is one of the best ways to capture higher quality images at night, but they can be kind of tricky, especially if you just bought one. So in today's tutorial, we're going to be looking at the basics of how a star tracker actually works, how to set it up properly, what camera settings to use, and a whole lot more. And the main focus of this video is going to be for wide angle shooting. I've already done a full length deep space video, so if you're going to be using a telephoto lens, you should head over and check that one out. It should be linked up here or also in the description of the video. Uh, so again, today we're just going to be focusing on wide angle shooting. Now for today's demo, I am going to be using the iOptron Skyguider Pro here. And as you can see, it's a very small, lightweight little tracker. I really enjoy using it. But if you haven't bought a star tracker yet, I already have a full length guide. So you can see the main differences between the major trackers. I'll have a link to that up here and also in the video description. I recommend checking that out if you're still completely new to auto guiders. But for everybody else, you can continue following along. And, you know, most of these trackers are going to operate virtually the same way. They're all going to have a piece up front that rotates. They're going to have more or less the same latitude base. Uh, so even if you don't have the Sky Guider Pro, you can still follow along today and just apply the same concepts to your own tracker. The first thing I want to cover in this tutorial is how these star trackers actually work. And once you understand that, it should make things a lot more easy for you. And honestly, it's very simple. All we're doing with our star tracker is we're pointing it up to the north or the south celestial pole. This is where all the stars appear to rotate around. And if you've ever done a uh, star trails photo where you take multiple photos over the course of the night, you get that final image. And if you've ever pointed north or south, you've seen this effect where right there in the center, that's the uh, center of the Earth's rotation. That's the north celestial pole in this case. That's where all the stars rotate around. And ultimately, our main goal with all of our star trackers is just to point as closely as we can to that point. Once we're pointed up to the north or south pole like that, then once we turn on the tracker, it's actually going to move everything very slowly in that circular motion with the stars. And that's what's going to allow us to shoot four or five minutes, maybe even longer, with our lenses now and capture much higher quality images. Next, I want to show you just how well these star trackers work. And in these comparison images, what you're seeing is a standard 20 second long photo versus a four minute long photo taken with a star tracker. And as you can see, there's a massive difference in image quality because the more light you can capture, the less grain you'll have, the more detail you can pull out, and you can even pull out some of those beautiful faint colors in the nebula. And this is why I highly recommend getting a star tracker, just because it allows you to shoot longer shutter speeds and overall capture more light. And that's just gonna help you out so much at night. It really will make a massive difference. Of course, there is one big downside to having a star tracker, and that is the fact that if it's slowly rotating your camera and following the stars, the stars will be sharp, but anything in your foreground will blur out. And that's gonna cause you some problems. So that's something you have to always keep in mind when you're shooting with a star tracker, is that basically you need to focus on the stars in one image and then focus in the foreground uh, in the other photo without the star tracker turned on. And then once you have both images, one where the stars are sharp but the foreground is blurred, and one where the foreground is sharp but the stars are blurred, then you can combine both photos and create a stunning final image. Now we're not going to have time to get into that post-processing workflow today, but if you want to check out my astrophotography post-processing course, there's uh, probably at least 10 hours of tutorial videos in there strictly on post-processing astrophotography images. And I would say there's probably five or six videos dedicated to this blending technique. And it's actually very simple once you get the hang of it. So if you want to learn how to do that, check out my course. Uh, and next we're going to talk about how to set up your star tracker properly to get those nice long exposures. And as we already discussed, all you really have to do is point this up to the north or south celestial pole where all the stars appear to rotate around. And it's actually very simple to do. First, you need to find north or south if you're in the southern hemisphere. And there's a lot of different ways you can do this. You can use an app on your phone and just hold it up and see which way north is. Uh, personally, I like to find the Big Dipper. This is uh, a constellation you can see anywhere in the northern hemisphere. Uh, even if you're in a light polluted area, you'll be able to see it very clearly. And as soon as you find the Big Dipper, which will only take you a, a couple of seconds, then you can draw a straight line out from the corner star, and that will always lead you directly to the north star. Once you found the north star, you found north. So all I do is I just come back behind the tracker, I crouch down, I reposition the tripod until I see the North Star right over the top, and that's all there is to it. Now I'm facing north. Again, this is honestly all you have to do for a wide-angle lens. You don't have to get much more precise than this. But there is 
one other piece to the puzzle, and that is the tracker needs to be angled up to the same spot in the sky where the north or south pole is. And that's where your latitude or altitude adjustments are gonna come in. Now that our star tracker is facing north, we need to dial in the latitude here on our base. So in order to find your current latitude, I recommend using the SAM console app. This is a free download. And once you have the SAM console app loaded up on your phone, we can click on the polar clock utility, then click on location, and it should very quickly tell you your current latitude and longitude. And then all we do is plug that number right in here on our base. In this case, I'm at about 41 degrees north, so I'm gonna loosen my little lever here and then adjust until I'm as close as I can to 41. You don't have to be super precise here, and these bases aren't that precise to begin with, so uh, as long as you're close, right around there, then I can lock it down, and that's all there is to it. Now my star tracker is facing north, and it's angled up to the right spot where the north or south pole should be. One other thing I wanna mention is that if you're above 40 degrees north or south, you'll have to flip everything around, and that's actually very simple. What I'm gonna do is just rotate this kinda back to start and then at this point I can quickly flip the entire Sky Guider Pro around like so reattach it like that and now I can just keep angling it backwards until I get where I need to be whether that's 50 degrees north 60 degrees north etc now this is where the ioptron base doesn't perform nearly as well as the Skywatcher because you are kind of limited here and overall I did, I've had had some troubles with the Ioptron base. So if you do have troubles or if something breaks on here, I recommend going with the Skywatcher base instead. It's gonna hold the Sky Guide Pro just fine, but that one can actually go up to 90 degrees and it's overall just better design. So you might wanna check that out. That's something I cover in the full buying guide if you haven't seen that already. But just to recap, we've pointed the Star Tracker north, we've dialed in the correct latitude, so now we're up at the correct angle. Now we can continue on with our setup process. Now that the star tracker is facing north and angled up to the correct altitude, we just need to double check the bubble level on the base and then verify that our tripod legs are nice and tight. So I'm just gonna push down, make sure we're all good there. I even usually push the legs out to make sure they're extended fully. And then in this case, I'm gonna take the tracker off just so I can see the bubble level easier right here. And it already looks pretty good, but if the bubble level's off, you can adjust your legs as needed. Once it's nice and flat, we can reattach our star tracker and there we go we're pretty much finished with our setup to be honest this is all I do if I'm shooting with my 14 to 24 millimeter lens because since we're shooting so wide you really don't have to be precise at all with this polar alignment but what I'm going to show you next is how to use the polar scope build in here just to clear that up because I know that's kind of confusing once your polar scope is visible or if you have the sky tracker pro or the star adventure mini you'll need to attach your polar scope now we can do our precise polar alignment and the first thing you're going to have to do uh, with the Sky Guard Pro and the Star Adventure is get the reticle lined up. So just to show you here on the front, there's what's called the clutch here. You'll need to loosen this first and then rotate this red piece around while you're looking up through the polar scope. And you'll see it turn around uh, kind of like a clock. And you need to get it like with 12 at the top, 6 at the bottom, just like a normal analog clock. And once you have it in that position, you can tighten down the clutch and then continue on with your precise polar alignment. In order to do a precise polar alignment with our built-in polar scope, we are gonna to have to use an app. And there's a lot of different options here. There's Polar Finder if you're on Android. I know there's quite a few options for iPhone, but I'd recommend everybody just get the Start Adventure Mini Console to start off with. That's something we've already talked about, and it does a great job, even if you've got a Sky Gutter Pro or a Sky Tracker Pro. So once you load up the Start Adventure Mini Console, we'll click on the Polar Clock Utility, you should now see a reticle. And if you look very closely, there should be a dot on that reticle. That's gonna line up with Polaris and the reticle inside of our polar scope. Again, if you have the iOptron Sky Guider Pro, the Sky Tracker here, uh, it's, it's okay that the two uh, reticles don't quite line up. You just need to get it roughly in the same spot. Again, we're shooting at a wide angle, so this really isn't all that important anyway, uh, but just to be thorough. Uh, so once you've found where Polaris needs to be in the reticle, Again, think of it like a clock. If it's at 6.45 or 9 o'clock, whatever it is, now we need to adjust our base here to get the North Star visible in the same spot here in our polar scope. And to do that, we have two different screws. We have our azimuth adjustment screws and our altitude knob here on the back. And the way these work is we're gonna turn the azimuth adjustment screws in the same direction at the same time. And if you look real close, you can probably see the Star Tracker is very slightly turning to the left or the right. 
then I can turn them in the opposite direction and the star tracker will move the opposite way. That's how we're going to adjust things. And these are our azimuth adjustment screws and we turn them both at the same direction at the same time. That's going to move the North Star left or right once it's visible inside the polar scope. There's also the altitude adjustment knob here on the other side, which you've already seen. Uh, that's how we adjusted the altitude. So all we're going to do now is turn that knob as well. And when I turn this, you'll see that the star tracker is actually moving up or down. And when you're looking through the polar scope and doing this, the North Star will appear to move up and down. So between those technically three screws, but uh, your azimuth and your altitude knobs, we're going to position everything that way we can get the North Star as close as possible as we see in the app. And to be honest, this is where a lot of people have trouble is that they either can't find the North Star when they look through the polar scope or they see a bunch of stars. I'm not sure which is the correct one. So therefore, again, what I recommend doing is just crouching down behind your star tracker, looking over the top and making sure you're actually looking at Polaris and is right over the center. And if that's all done correctly, I also double check the latitude is dialed in correctly. So I'm up at the right spot. Then from there, you should see the North Star somewhere in the frame. Once it is visible, we'll just adjust our azimuth and our altitude adjustment knob and get it as close as we can to the app. And at that point, we're pretty much done. So we can tighten down all of our screws. And you really want to make sure that these screws are all locked down tight because if any of these are loose, your base will wobble and it's going to cause you some trouble later in the night. And then from here, we can attach our camera and continue on. But I want to reiterate here, this is not really necessary if you're going to be shooting at like 14 millimeters or even 35 millimeters. It's only necessary if you want to be very precise or if you're shooting probably 50 millimeters and up, you do want to use the polar scope and use the app and do all that precise adjustments. But if you're just shooting very wide angle nightscapes, as long as this thing is pointed north and you've dotted in the latitude, it's really good enough. One other thing I want to mention before I forget, because I always get like a dozen questions on every video, I am using the Faisal CT344T tripod. This is a carbon fiber tripod. And as you can see, there's no center column. So my latitude base there attaches directly to the base of the tripod. And that gives me really stable results. Uh, it is a carbon fiber tripod though, so it's not as sturdy as it could be, but I really haven't any, had any issues with it. So that's the tripod I'm using. I recommend it, but there's definitely some cheaper options out there that might work a little bit better, or you might want to get a heavier duty tripod uh, just to be more secure. Just to recap how these star trackers actually work, once the tracker is pointed up to the north or south celestial pole where all the stars rotate around and you turn on the tracker, it's going to move your entire camera very slowly in one direction or the other. And this is going to follow the same speed and motion of the stars. Therefore, you can shoot four or five minutes now and the stars will still be sharp, but your foreground will blur out because, of course, your camera is constantly moving now. And it doesn't matter where your camera is facing. You can face it north, you can face it south. You can do whatever you want. It's still going to move in the correct direction. All that really matters is that your tracker is facing north or south and the latitude has been dialed in correctly and you're as close as possible to that point where the stars rotate around. Provided you've done that, you can do whatever you want with the camera and you're still going to have great sharp stars even after four or five minutes with a wide angle lens. So all you have to do in the default configuration is install your ball head to this main screw. Once your ball head is nice and tight, you can attach your camera and now you have free access to any portion of the night sky with this ball head attached. So pretty simple, right? It takes about two minutes to set up and then from here, we can move our camera wherever we want to. As I mentioned earlier though, since the foreground is gonna blur out, as long as the star tracker is turned on, you generally wanna keep this mostly aimed at the sky because anything in your foreground is gonna blur out anyway. It's just gonna make your life a lot more difficult later on. So when I'm doing my tracked images with my wide angle lens, it's usually angled up right where the Milky Way is at. And that's really all you have to do. There is one caveat here though, and pretty much all the star trackers operate the same way. If you're going to be using three or four pounds of camera gear total, that includes the ball head, you probably don't want to go with this mounting option because it's going to put a lot of strain on the tracker itself. And therefore, if you're going to be using a big, heavy lens like the Nikon 20, uh, 14 to 24 and a Nikon D750, you're probably going to want to install the declination bracket instead. That's more designed for heavier camera setups, and it's just going to put a lot less stress on the star tracker and should even give you uh, some better results. But it is a little bit more of a pain to set up. So this is the way I recommend it. If you've got a small DSLR or a mirrorless camera, this is all you have to do and you're ready to shoot. 
But if you have a big setup like I do, you might want to install the declination bracket. So that's what we're going to look at next. Now, since I use a very large camera and lens, that's a Nikon D750 with the Nikon 14 and 24, that alone probably weighs five pounds. And then you factor in the ball head and all that. That's a pretty beefy setup. So I am going to need the declination bracket as well as a counterweight. And even if you have the Star Adventure, the Mini, or the Sky Tracker Pro, these are all going to work largely the same. But for the Sky Guider Pro anyway, it's very easy. We're just going to line up these grooves here on the back with the uh, grooves here and then tighten it down. And you might be looking at my declination bracket right now and realizing it's not quite the way yours is set up if you just got your Sky Guider Pro. And that's something I cover in the full tutorial. You might want to check that out. I'll have that pop up in the corner again. Uh, it's not really that important, but I'd recommend at least checking it out. So the way this is going to work is we have a counterweight here. We can move this up or down. And our goal is to balance out our camera and lens. So I'm going to go grab my camera and I'll show you how this actually works. One other thing we gotta talk about before I attach my camera is that there's a lot of different mounting options for the Sky Guider Pro. For the Star Adventure, it's much more straightforward, but uh, if you do have the Sky Guider Pro, you'll wanna grab this circular piece and install it to the circular piece up here. If you look real close, you'll notice there's a big screw here, not the little one that comes pre-installed, and you can just very easily unscrew it and then put on the big screw. That way, I can just put this right into my ball head. Otherwise, I would need a threaded adapter, and that's just not gonna be as sturdy as I would like. So once you've installed the big screw here that'll fit directly in the bottom of your ball head, we can attach this. I recommend doing this before you attach it all to there. Double check here on the back, it's nice and tight. And then just plop it on however you want. There we go. So now I can reach any position in the sky I want now that we have the ball head attached. And to continue on, I'm gonna go grab my camera finally, and then we'll do our counterweight balancing. Once your camera is attached, make sure this ball head is nice and tight because I've had a few close calls where this swings loose and it's almost always giving me a heart attack. Uh, that's why there's different ways you can mount this that are more secure, which I cover in the uh, full Sky Guider Pro course. And you can even see now the weight of this lens is just moving the ball head down. And that's why you really need to have a sturdy ball head if you're gonna be using a big lens and got it. make sure it's nice and tight that way this thing doesn't droop at all. Uh, and as you can see, the star tracker is pointed north, but my camera is facing south. So I can reach any position in the sky I want. I can even face it north, east, south. It really doesn't matter uh, because we have the ball head functionality. But what you'll want to do is position this, you know, wherever you want to start photographing. Let's say the Milky Way is up around here. So once you get it kind of close, you can tighten everything down. Make sure everything really is locked in tight here before you do anything else. Now we need to balance the counterweight. So I'm gonna loosen the clutch here and then just let it fall, but keep a firm hand on the camera and the lens. And our goal now is to move the counterweight in or out so that way neither the camera side nor the counterweight side pulls down. You can see my ball head just swung loose, which is what I was trying to warn you about. Almost gave me another heart attack there. Uh, so that's why this isn't the best way to mount things. It's just uh, the easiest for me right now. And again, I cover that in the full Sky Guider Pro course if you want to learn more, uh, better ways to mount everything. Uh, anyway, I'm going to move the counterweight out in this case. And in fact, oh, there we go. I'm pretty much pushing this to the limit. Sometimes you might need a second counterweight, believe it or not. And there we go. So now neither the camera or the counterweight is pulling down. We're perfectly balanced. I can rotate everything back up to the top, lock it down. And now I can start taking my photos. But if I were to reposition my lens to another region of the sky, that's gonna throw off the balance. So every time you move the lens like this, it's always a good idea to loosen the clutch again and double check the counterweight balance. In this case, it worked out fine, but more often than not, you will need to rebalance things when you move your camera around. And one other tip I wanna make here is that, as I alluded to earlier, this is probably not the way your declination bracket's gonna look from the factory if you got the Sky Guider Pro, you'll notice my camera is mounted to the short end of the declination bracket compared to the long end. And that just gives me more leverage for the counterweight because otherwise my camera would be even higher up out here and I definitely need two counterweights. So I cover that, again, all of my other videos. If you've got the Skywatcher Star Adventure, you can actually just slide this whole piece down. So I kind of like that design better. And that helps you get more leverage on the counterweight side. So that tends to work 
a lot nicer. Anyway, once your camera system is balanced and you're pointed up at the right region of the sky that you want and you verified everything really is locked down nice and tight, now we can talk about what camera settings to use and how to take our long exposures. When you're on location and you've got everything ready to go, I recommend taking a test photo before you invest a lot of time in your tracked exposure. So the first thing I do is put the camera to complete manual mode. So that's uh, full manual focus here on the lens or the camera body itself. We're not on aperture priority, we're not on full auto, we're on full manual. And then from there we can adjust our shutter speed, aperture, and our ISO. For these initial test photos, we're just verifying that the composition looks good and everything is focused. So we don't really have to do anything special. I put my ISO to 12,800, my aperture to f2.8 or f4, and the shutter speed is going to be 10 or 15 seconds. That's really all you have to do. And then we'll take a test photo with the tracker turned on. You can leave it turned off, it really doesn't matter. Again, all we're doing with these shots is just verifying that our composition looks good and everything's lined up properly. And you also want to zoom in and make sure the stars are actually focused. While we're on the subject of focusing on stars, it's actually very simple. We're just going to turn on the camera, turn on live view, and now we're going to zoom in using the buttons here on the back. And once we find a bright star, we're going to zoom in on it and just slowly tweak the focus ring back and forth until that star is as small as possible. And if you don't see any stars at all, you can always readjust the position of your camera until you see a bright star there in live view and go from there. But once the lens is focused, you're ready to continue on and take another test photo and just make sure the composition looks good. Once you've gotten a test photo that you're happy with and everything looks good, now we can finally start using our actual camera settings. And for this, we'll actually need an external remote that way we can shoot longer than 30 seconds. So I'm gonna go grab mine and then we'll continue on. Now I am using the Velo Shutter Boss 2 remote. This has worked really well for me. I haven't had any serious issues at all. Uh, so I'd recommend it. There's a lot of other options out there as well, including wireless remotes. So pick whatever you think is gonna work well for you and then attach it to your camera. And this is what's gonna allow us to shoot longer than 30 seconds. So in order to set everything up properly, we'll want to adjust our shutter speed next and put it to bulb mode. You'll find this usually one past 30 seconds. So go all the way to 30 seconds, move your shutter speed dial one more. It should now say bulb on most cameras. On some Canon cameras, it's gonna be on the top dial over on the left, there'll be a B. Either way, once you get bulb mode ready on your camera, now we can adjust the aperture and the ISO, and then finally set our shutter speed via the remote. Your aperture is pretty simple. I usually just set it to f2.8 or f4. Not really a big deal there. Your ISO is mainly gonna depend on how long your shutter is. So anywhere from ISO 800 to 1600 in most cases is gonna work fine. It also depends on what kind of camera sensor you have. Uh, that's a whole nother video. If you wanna learn more, check out my ISO and variance uh, tutorial. That'll clear that up. But again, most people just put the ISO 800 to 1600, it's gonna work fine. And now we can use a remote to dial in our shutter speed. And if you're gonna be using a very wide angle lens, you could probably shoot four or five minutes easy. There are some downsides to that, but it's really up to you. You can put the shutter speed to whatever you want, click start, make sure your tracker's turned on, of course. And now it's gonna slowly move your camera just like the stars are moving overhead. And you should have sharp stars even after four or five minutes, provided you've done a decent polar alignment. And the tracker is, of course, turned on. Once that photo finishes, you can click stop on your remote. If it's set up to do an interval, or you can just come over here, look at the playback. And what you wanna do is just zoom in on the stars, make sure that there's no star trails. If you see star trails, that either means your shutter speed was too long, or you just didn't do your polar alignment right. So recheck those and also make sure the tracker is turned on and then try again. Uh, again, some guidelines, if you're between 14 and 35 millimeters, you should easily be able to get three minutes, if not five minutes. If you're at 50 millimeters or higher, let's say to 200, you could probably get a minute to two minutes. And beyond that, you'll wanna check out my deep space uh, video, which I go into a lot more depth. And that also brings me to another point we're not gonna have time to get into attaching a telephoto lens today. I do have a full tutorial on that. I think I talked about that earlier, but I'll have a link up here. You can check that video out. That's my deep space one where we cover all this, but for telephoto lenses. The final thing I wanna to touch on is taking your foreground and your sky exposures. Remember, you can take your foreground exposures. You don't even need to take the star tracker. Just go out with your tripod, get some great foreground shots, usually the same camera settings you're gonna use with this tracker. And then once you've taken those images, make sure you make a note of where the Milky Way is at. And you can always just click on your playback screen and see that. And you can head back to the car, set up your star tracker right there. And then that's where you can take your tracked exposures for the sky. And the reason I recommend doing that is because 
If you were to take both images in the exact same location, one with the tracker turned on, one with the tracker turned off, anything in your foreground is going to blur out and it's going to make blending a nightmare. Now with that said, I do cover that process in depth in my astrophotography post-processing course that has over 10 hours of videos and there's a lot devoted to this blending because it can be pretty tricky. So if you want to be a purist and take your foreground and your sky right in the same location, I'll show you how to do it. Again, I'll have a link in the video for that if you want to check out that course that'll really help you out. And that is included with all of my Star Tracker tutorials. So if you get uh, the Sky Guider Pro full course or the Star Adventure full course, you'll get all of the post-processing as well. Uh, but that is one of the trickiest things is just taking the foreground and the sky exposures and then blending them. And that's something I do cover in depth. But with all that in mind, that's really all there is to it for a Star Tracker. It's honestly not that hard once you get the hang of it. Since you're shooting with a wide angle, in this case, all you have to do is point this thing north, dial in your latitude. You're now pointing up to that spot in the sky where all the stars rotate around. Then you either attach your camera using the declination bracket and the counterweight, point it up where you want, take some test photos, and then take your tracked uh, exposure for the stars, and then take your just static exposure for the foreground. And you're now going to start capturing amazing images with your star tracker. And that's about all I have for you. So I hope this cleared everything up. If you were just getting into star trackers or if you think about buying one, you now know what you're in for. Uh, but I can tell you from personal experience, this is definitely the best investment I've made for astrophotography equipment. You know, a new lens is great. Uh, you're gonna have better star performance usually, more light, but nothing really compares to being able to take a four or five minute long exposure. The difference in your images is really gonna be amazing. And for me, I wish I would have just done this sooner. It would have saved me a lot of headaches. So if you want to learn even more about star trackers, including how to do post-processing, how to plan out your Milky Way photo shoots, what other camera gear to get, what camera settings to actually use on the field. I also have some on-location videos where I cover the polar alignment process in a lot more detail. I look at various ways to set up your own star tracker. So if you've got the Star Adventure, the Star Adventure Mini, the Sky Tracker Pro, I've got a full course for each one. It's all available over on my website. And if you are interested in deep space, then you'll want to check out some of my other videos here on YouTube or uh, my deep space course. That's where we go into a lot more about that. But that's about all I have for you. So I hope you enjoyed the tutorial, and I'll catch you in the next video.